let me then uh, quickly introduce myself. Um, yeah, so uh, as uh, it also already mentioned, my name is Yvan or Eugene Berko, whatever you prefer. I'm head of big data office responsible for all the data and, uh, and analytics uh, activities at Alex. I have uh, rather extensive, I think more than 10 years, 11 years of experience in all data related stuff. Um, during the last couple of years, I'm, I was mostly focusing on creating data strategies for the uh, big enterprises and uh, monetizing data and that what I'll be uh, talking about um, during the next, I think, uh, 25 something uh, minutes, and then we can go to the questions. So uh, quick, I think a uh, quick uh, couple of words about agenda. I will go through the, um, uh, the the term itself. I know the different models of the monetizing all the, you know, uh, problems that arise when you try to do it that, and then into the use cases. Uh, to which I will dedicate some some time, I guess. Uh, yeah, so let's let's jump in uh, without further ado. So uh, what's what is this data monetization thing? So uh, there are a lot of definitions, but I think all of them uh, go down to something that, you know, um, using data for some kind of economical benefit that you can measure. So it, it's a rather broad definition and obviously uh, it includes uh, the ways when you can uh, monetize the data internally, uh, basically using the data to your own advantage, uh, making um, um, a smart decision based of it, or maybe I know uh, using it to enhance your uh, service offering, or uh, doing something like you know external data monetization when you sell that directly to to your clients or something like that. And I will be focusing more on the second uh, part of it. I think that's what what I've seen a lot of people actually think monetization is just selling the data, but in general, it's it's a broad term that also includes the internal one. So. Um, Basically, the market, a couple of words about state of the market. Uh, the market itself is pretty old. Uh, people have been selling the data for quite for quite a while. I mean, for, for example, if you take financial data, data from financial markets that has been sold since the beginning of those markets. So we have like a more than 100 years of history in that. Uh, but um, the market itself is, is very different. I mean, for each industry, there are industries like, for example, if you call, if you know, Think about something like direct marketing, uh, data monetization. There has been for a while. Obviously, same goes for you know market data. Um, um, uh, same goes for you know uh, the data that you have in telecom, um, uh, weather data, something like that. But in general, if we are talking about you know across domain stuff. Uh, not a lot of companies have that mindset and this is uh, the figures from the bark study i think they are uh, they were doing the if i if i'm not mistaken they were doing this research um, for all of the types of data monetization including internal ones so uh, as you can see here the numbers are pretty low so it's 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 a developing market that's what i'm trying to say but it's it's growing rapidly so uh, there are a lot of predictions uh, from what you can see there's a market uh, market uh, market and markets markets and markets sorry <laughs> a research that said that um basically currently we have like 2.3 billion um um dollars um market while in couple of years i think in five years it should uh be three times that or something if, if yeah I, I think that's the exact figure yeah so yeah the market is growing obviously and it's one of the you know gardeners trend and so on uh, yeah, so there are different types that I've already mentioned. The direct data monetization, which is basically selling your data uh, in one way or another, or indirect monetization. Um, sometimes they're called external and internal, and indirect or internal basically means you know using the data to your advantage uh, within the company. You know, by, by making a better decisions. Uh, you know, uh, using it for example to reduce costs or you know um, increase revenue um, you know so, something like that i mean there are a lot of different use cases as i said i'll be mostly focusing on the direct monetization so uh, obviously there are other different classifications like b2b when uh, to companies you know uh, I'm talking about once again direct monetization when uh, one company se sells data to another company or you can have B2C when a company sells data to its uh, individual consumer uh, customers. Uh, there will be examples of that in, in the 
future slides. So uh, what can you sell? I mean, obviously you can sell raw data as it is, you know, all kinds of data, text files, you know, images, uh, satellite images, for example, uh, that's, that has been sold for quite a while now and it's, it has a hefty price typically. A geospatial data, all kinds of weather data, for example. Um, apart from raw data, you can uh, sell insights, basically, some some kind of analytics that you do on top of the data and you send it and distribute it to your customers. I will be talking about use cases um, uh, in the end, but uh, uh, an example, the thing is that you don't really even need to own the data that you are using to producing insights. Basically, you can uh, take open data, uh, do some kind of ML stuff, you know, classification stuff, or you uh, just combine data from different open sources, you know, cross it, match it, and then you you can sell it as a package that actually works. There have been um, situations like that. Um, and also you can uh, not sell the data directly, but you can uh, sell it as a part of your, uh, you know, service offering or a product or call it whatever you prefer. Um, basically an example of it uh, will be once again in the use cases, but um, imagine that you are selling um, some kind of you know, uh, basically you have a, a web portal that provides some, some kind of information to users and you can also uh, embed some kind of insight that would be useful for the customer. Um, yes, so uh, I've talked to a lot of companies about that. Um, and the, the, whenever I ask a question, why do they still, or why aren't they still doing it? Uh, I think number one question uh, answer to that was, it's not really their business model. Um, it's it's kind of natural, because if you have a um, company that, that has been, uh, it's basically a manufacturing company, for example, that has been producing, I don't know, um, computer parts, uh, something like that, uh, their whole, infrastructure, their whole organization is really suited to that. I mean, their sales people are, they know how to sell um, computer parts, uh, you know, they, they they know how to manufacture it, um, where, where to, you know, how to build their relationship with vendors and stuff. But once uh, you're start, uh, you're, you're talking about something very different, obviously that becomes an organizational problem. Uh, the second reason is that people, uh, strangely enough, not always understand that the data they are using or creating on daily basis has actually a lot of value. Obviously, it has value for them because they are using it, but they are not sure uh, they were not they, they didn't really know that they can actually sell it and if they sell it what's the price how you know how how we approach it and so on the third uh, answer to that question was obviously it requires a lot of investments especially in the area of you know ensuring data quality making sure you know um, supporting the uh, you know providing supports and sla and and so on to the you know the, the product that, that you are selling um Yep. So uh, obviously, there's there's um, way more than one way to to sell the data. Obviously, you can uh, just you know charge money on uh, some kind of flat rate or whatever you prefer, uh, but you can also uh, can include it as a part of your service, which means that you will not be um, customer will not be paying money uh, for them uh, for that particular I know data set, for example, but uh, you can use that insight or data to um, increase your um, overall uh, service price. And uh, it's it's really strange, but there has actually been um, cases that I've seen uh, where a barter has happened uh, between different companies, uh, for example, in the supply chain uh, air, uh, domain, when, you know, uh, neighbor, I mean, the companies were close in the supply chain and uh, they were, uh, you know, sharing the information uh, between themselves, you know, to better understand the market and, you know, uh, do a bit more better um, uh, pr predictions, you know, in terms of how many products should they produce the next quarter and something like that. So yeah, so strangely enough, there has been uh, cases of that. Uh, yep. Uh, so um, as for the technology, that's that's an obvious and important question. Um, when selling your own data, obviously you can go with, you know, custom development. Basically, you can create infrastructure on your own. You can maintain it. You can create a RESTful API or any other API you prefer. You can use some kind of file shares. Uh, you can create a web portal that your clients will use to, to get the data. Uh, you can even use email distribution. Why not? That has happened. It's not 
the, <laughs> the most user friendly thing. But I mean, that really depends on the what kind of data are you selling. If, if what if uh, what you're selling is just I know, a couple of numbers, um, you know, each quarter. Sure, why not? Email distribution works just fine. Um, there has been cases when uh, even the um, uh, data vendor has been pushing uh, the data themselves to the client's infrastructure. Basically, uh, the client provides them with some kind of you know, uh, credentials to access that infrastructure and the vendor actually pushes the data uh, themselves. Um, yep, yeah, pretty, you know, uh, pretty handy, I guess. Very little um, investment needed. Uh, so uh, obviously, uh, the uh, you can also use existing data marketplaces. There's actually quite a while of those. Uh, there are uh, they are very different. I mean, you have um, marketplaces for sensor data. You have you know more of a general or industry specific. So the ones that I've mentioned, I've tried to come up with you know industry agnostic, not specialized. You know like healthcare or insurance marketplaces um, that that focus on commercial data. For example, not really open data like government data or you know something that should be public and uh, those that are targeted at both like vendors and consumers so vendors can upload the data and consumers they get the data um because i mean obviously uh, some of the big companies have their own individual um marketplaces when they just sell their own data uh, so obviously you can you cannot really use that so uh, i mean a pretty big one aws data exchange it has i think uh, more than uh, 3,000 different data sets from what I recall. Uh, it's pretty big one. Um, there's also data rate. There's Snowflake marketplace. I think IBM has a marketplace. Uh, Microsoft Azure data market has, has been there for six years, but it has been closed quite a while ago. Uh, you can also use existing platforms for distributing data. A great example is Azure Data Share Marketplace. As uh, sorry, Azure Data Share, which is a cloud service that provides you uh, with you know you can easily share um, whatever data you have in your uh, you know cloud storage or other services, which is an amazing idea. I haven't actually used that yet, but I'm really looking forward to to trying that out. Um, yeah, so basically. Uh, once again, when I talk to data vendors, I think uh, two most common problems that they voiced was uh, problems with the data quality and piracy or auth uh, unauthorized usage. Basically, data quality, yeah, it's kind of obvious. You have to take care of the data and uh, that it, you're selling. It, it should it should be you no, know, it should be quality data, no problems, error whatsoever, whatsoever. And piracy and authorized use. I was very surprised when I heard that, but that's actually a problem when people are you know uh, paying for that data, uh, you know, downloading it and reselling it. I was um, pretty shocked to to hear that 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 still happens. I mean, I, I thought it kind of. Um, that happens in a different domains, but yeah, it, it's a problem. So um, the next thing you really have to keep in mind is once again support and SLA. So I've been uh, in the companies that were buying a lot of data, and I recall two two times when we skipped uh, when we um, um, said uh, goodbye to a vendor because um, the vendor couldn't just um, provide enough, you know, support. I mean, it's uh, we uh, we find a problem with it within the data. We we say there is a problem. Problem, please fix it and they just you know ignore it for for a long time and that was really unacceptable and you come ahead you can come up with SLA for example you know major problems within that data set should be fixed um I don't know in the next I don't know couple of days something like that or if it's something smaller you can you know have a one week SLA or something like that kind of goes without saying but you have to think about a compliance and data privacy that, that actually should say compliance um you know obviously gdpr you know california data protection act and all all, all of the other compliances that you can be affected by uh, that kind of goes without saying uh, marketing and I'm not really talking about only advertising I'm talking about the whole marketing mix you know a product a product a place promotion price um, uh, it's 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 there's there should go a lot of thought in that I mean that that's the great topic I would like to speak about in the future because it's just a very big thing to, to talk about but yeah you have to think about it uh, Kind of goes without saying, but um, if you are an analytical company, um, or or even if you are a company and you have some valuable insight for the industry, you have to 
be very careful not to sell your own competitive advantage. Because if you know uh, things about the market that your competitors do not, you have to think twice before you know monetizing the data and my meaning is selling it. It's kind of no brainer, but uh, yeah, I, sh I still should waste it. Um, your data has to be properly documented. Uh, once again, uh, your clients have to understand what they are buying and uh, what they are seeing on their screens. And you have to think about licensing models. There are quite a few, you know, different ones. Um, I mean, uh, you can, you know, charge for the, you know, um, um, basically for a flat rate for, you know, until the end of the time, but just basically, you know, sell data set and that's it. Or you can charge, uh, you know, rate, uh, you know, per month or something. I mean, the different options apply. Uh, yeah, let me just. OK, five minutes. Um, yeah, so I have uh, 12 use cases, so I'll go through them quickly. Um, first of all, it's not really a data monetization use case. It's just some case uh, I wanted to talk about because it really shows the, uh, the value that the, uh, the data gives to the company. So Amazon bought a Whole Foods market. Uh, it's a big uh, US uh, um, store chain. I think it's 40 years old and they bought it to, uh, in order to better understand customers in that market before actually um, Amazon makes a move into that market. So yeah, that's that blew my mind when I read it. And um, yeah, so as I said, it, you really, data could really increase the value of the company itself. Even if, if data is not something you do, because obviously Whole Foods Market wasn't really thinking about, you know, the data when they, you know, started and, you know, were expanding and, and so on. Um, then, uh, so as you can see, I've, I've tried to uh, come up with very different use cases from different industries that are very different, you know, from each other. So uh, Michelin is uh, obviously uh, a company that manufactures tires, and not only that, if if if, if you remember, you know, the, the, uh, the Michelin stars, you know, to, that are given to the restaurants. So basically, in order to expand their offering and diversify their the revenue uh, sources, they also sell uh, raw tire, tire data and um, insights, you know, different kind of insights to study driver behavior and, you know, uh, better tailor cars to that and, and so on. I, I remember browsing their data sets and I, I don't even recall which uh, uh, marketplace, but I definitely recall those. Uh, then uh, IMDb, I'm a big movie fan and IMDb I think is familiar to every one of you who actually you know likes movies. Uh, that's the internet movie database when you can you know browse all of the movies, actors, directors, um, writers and so on and so on. And basically uh, the interesting thing that they, they sell their own data uh, in uh, two different uh, places. First of all, they, they sell, uh, they have the, the API that uh, you have different tiers and you uh, sell uh, the um, basically the different tiers based on the requests. I mean, you can get the information about specific movie act or something like that. And then also I've seen their data on AWS data exchange when they sell the whole data set that you know can contain like millions of or even I think billions, maybe I, I assume um, rows of information about you know ratings and, and, and that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, you will not believe how much that costs. Just you know, go to AWS data exchange. IMDb will be there in the top of the list and just look at the price. I was blown away. <laughs> that <laughs> that's that's a big 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 amount of money. So um, interoperability. Intero Interoperability Institute uh, sells um, um, uh, hyper-realistic data for healthcare. The, uh, the, the interesting thing about this use case is that they are not selling actual real data. They are selling synthetic patient data. Basically, they, they, it was generated in a very specific way to make it very realistic and it can be used for you know, all kinds of testing purposes from, um, you know, um, in healthcare, if you want to, I know, test some hypothesis about, you know, uh, um, you know, treatment or something like that. I'm not really a health healthcare professional, but uh, yeah, from what I've seen, they they're selling a lot of, you know, different data set uh, generated specifically for different cases. Um, what? Um, uh, uh, yeah, okay, so Axiom uh, is the biggest company that you've never heard of. That's that's how they were called. Uh, they were, I think, the first ones to do the uh, data-driven direct marketing uh, way, way back ago. Um, basically, they were using all kinds of public data. They were joining it, I mean, across um, 
um, cross-checking uh, information and uh, uh, com coming up with a list of you know, different people that could be potentially used in some kind of product. And they could, you know, they were selling those lists to their own customers. Uh, yeah, so basically they were pioneer in that. Uh, in terms of data monetization, I think this direct marketing thing, you know, uh, the data that helps you understand better your customer, I think that's like basically the hot potato of the data monetization. I mean, that industry has been for a while and it's, I mean, if you go to the AWS data exchange, that kind of data, I think it's marketing data is uh, basically uh, has the biggest amount of data sets. So, uh, uh, I'll, yeah, I run out of time. Sorry for that. Uh, I'll go quickly to the to the rest of those. So basically, another case is from oil and gas industry. Uh, it's uh, basically a company uh, was uh, GRT Gas was combining data from all kinds of different public and uh, sources and uh, sometimes buying some some data. Uh, they were um, joining the data in order to pr present a, um, a, a bird's eye view uh, of the whole industry, you know, how the natural gas flows through Europe. And Medisafe, uh, that's actually a very interesting case. Um, uh, it's a company that sells a basically application that helps you manage your, you know, pills intake. and um, that that's the main thing that they do, but they also accumulate data about how people actually uh, take their medication. Because uh, you know you not always take them as as you should. There there are some discrepancies and so on, and that they actually sell that data. Uh, another very interesting. Um, uh, health uh, use case from healthcare is. Um, a, it's what I've found on AWS data exchange. Basically, a company sells just you know uh, pricing for all of the hospitals in Massachusetts, uh, um, and that, that's basically it. I mean, you have all of the list of um, services that they offer, and you can check each and every hospital and compare their prices. As simple as that. I assume you know that's kind of that's the free um, um, public data that they combined, and actually you know they come up with something that you can actually sell. A very simple use case. Um, uh, a construction data broker, uh, that's actually a company that uh, I've met a guy on a conference that, that worked for that company and we talk and he, uh, the company is basically a data broker. They once again joined the um, public data, some data they additionally buy and provide uh, their clients information about the ongoing constructions on the East Coast in, in the US. Um, another case of how can you use public data, apply some something to it and then sell it is IBM Analytics for Twitter services basically gives you ability to analyze, you know, Twitter data. That's that's what it is. Uh, a Vodafone is um, it's a use case. Um, is, I mean, I think all, all of us heard about Vodafone. It's, a, you know, a mobile uh, telecom provider, I guess that's that's how you call it. Um, uh, they are, uh, you know, gathering. They have uh, obviously a lot of data about movements of users, and that data could be leveraged by, the, you know, tourist industry, uh, real estate industry, um, basically all kinds of, you know, restaurants and so on, you know, to have to have better understanding of the movements of, the, you know, of the people. Um, and a rather interesting case is it's a very simple case, but shows you how you can uh, do the monetization, you know, B two C. Uh, when um, basically LinkedIn offers a package when um, that includes uh, the premium package that includes who viewed your profile information, um, and that's 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 a you know you can argue if that's really the data monetization case uh, on its own, but it's 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 a great example how a company accumulates that some kind of data and then sells it back to you, and it's it's a very basic thing I guess. Uh, and it really enhances your enhances the company offering to to, to its its customers. Um, yes, so I think yeah, I think that's it. Uh, first of all, before I end the presentation, I just wanted you know I, uh, to add if you're interested in in the subject, obviously there's a lot of books uh, on on the subject of data monetization. I can also recommend I think the book about data strategy by Bernard Marr. I think one of the use cases I've been using is actually from that book, if I recall correctly. Um, and also there are a lot of you know public information about monetization and you have if you have any questions please feel free to reach out to me on via linkedin or my work email or uh, any other way if, if you can find you know on facebook or something yeah uh, so I, th I think that's it uh, so uh, any questions 
So, Eugene, I have actually have several questions which we got uh, on our email. Um, so the I'd say the broader one uh, is from from the anonymous, but still, um, the person is asking like how to start uh, with the data monetization, like when you are just looking for some idea and uh, just trying to get into business. Is there any tip from your side? OK, well, that really depends uh, if you just want uh, that. That really depends what you want to do. If you want to, you know, to acquire to get some, um, uh, you know, public data, join it and sell it as a, um, you know, uh, some kind of offering. That's that's a different case from if you are a big company that, you know, uh, does other things and you're thinking about how can we you know leverage the data that we have within the company. That's a different case. I mean, the second case is uh, a bit more, I guess, I wouldn't say interesting, but um, it's a bit more, um, I guess, well, challenging maybe, because um, the thing is that you have to first identify what kind of data do you create within your company. Because obviously big enterprises create a lot of data, and then you have to understand what parts of that, I mean, which date, which data sets, I guess, actually have value for which other companies will pay. Um, if you are 100 percent sure about that, you, you should still do some, you know, a hypothesis and try to validate them. Um, you can um, um, you can do some, uh, you know, uh, I, I would suggest, you know, hiring some someone who really knows the data monetization business and maybe that person can advise you. But uh, overall. I would um, I would really rely on the people who know who have industry experience and who can validate if that data actually has value that for which other companies would pay. And after that, it's more of a like a trivial thing. You have to understand who will be responsible for enough you know, data stewardship, who will be responsible for the quality of data, who will be responsible for the, you know, uh, how you will sell it, will you sell it via, uh, you know, uh, your own infrastructure, APIs, you know, file shares or whatever, or will you be using, uh, you know, marketplaces? Um, and then uh, you will you have to come up with the price and you know marketing strategy and so on and so on. So, um, yeah, I mean, but overall, you really have to first understand what data do you create and will people be interested in that? Will they be buying it? So yeah, that's basically, we can sum up that the professional consultation is required as it is at, at the very beginning, and the earlier you get it the better results you can get. Well, yeah, it's it's always a good case, you know, a good advice to to talk to somebody that that actually understands the business, understands sure. the data. And I'm not always, you know, as I said, it, it it could be just a, you know, industry expert from within your company that really knows that stuff. But it's it's also wouldn't hurt if you know talk to some kind of, some kind of person that actually did data monetization in the past. I think that that would that would help. Yeah, we have a Jet guy who is raising the hand, so I'm allowing him to give his question. Jet guy, thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry, my name looks weird on there. It's my name is Jedry Davila. <laughs> um, that's my other surname on there. Um, so uh, you were just speaking about um, how to monetize and like how to sell it, like whether it's your business or. Um, within your business or outside your business, the data, right? I'm working on a startup uh, called a caregiver AI, which is going to be very intrusive in regards to the the client and also um, like, you know, the family members, because it's going to be always um, imagine like Alexa, but it's 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 like a caregiver Alexa, pretty much so virtual assistant. Um, what is the model in your experience that is used to protect such data? Um, you know, it's personal identifiable data. I mean, I'm sure there's always going to be stuff that people are saying within the household that the system is going to pick up. What um, I'm reading about some of the strategies people use to secure data, but I just want to hear what what you have to say about how people secure that information that is so valuable. So um, yeah, that's a great question. First of all, um, well, obviously you have to think about compliance, you know, and different compliance mm -hmm. frame like like GDPR, you know, California Data Protection Arts and uh, Act, and all of the uh, you know similar um, uh, compliances. Basically, if you have some kind of 
so from what I understood, basically that the thing will pick up uh, the you know conversations from within the uh, you know a household, family household, and you will store it sometime uh, somewhere. Um, well, I, mean, I think rather obvious advice is try to. Um, find some kind of uh, sensitive, you know, personal information within that and try to, you know, uh, delete it or uh, some kind of just anonymize it so it's not stored there because obviously GDPR will uh, um, uh, it, it's against the GDPR to store the data just just for, you know, storing purposes and not um, and unless you have a very specific reason to store it and also um you know there's also the um, right to be forgotten stuff and um you should you know encrypt it i mean i don't have i don't understand i mean obviously the um the innards of of your um uh, product but i would suggest you know trying to identify the sensitive information or social security numbers emails telephone numbers and just delete it if that's possible from uh, from your you know uh, data data store um I've, I've seen people uh, monetizing data in healthcare and they basically were just you know un anonymizing stuff i mean the data was still there you can you can share it just you know make sure that um Nobody can actually identify real people based on that. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? Yeah, you were talking about uh, how to delete the personal identifiable information and um, when storing, you mentioned, I, I don't think I've heard that you mentioned something that um, you can't just store things for the sake of storing it. Yeah, I was talking about the GDPR. Basically, you know, you can you can Google the requirements, but I mean, there's there's not really a lot of them. Uh, basically, you shouldn't store uh, you should store personally identifiable information only if you really have to for the oh. amount of time that you really really have to. Uh, for example, I mean, if you are if somebody really you know is is, is buying some something for you, obviously you can you know, have their emails and stuff. But if that user is gone from your system, there is no really need for you to, you know, to still store their um, information. And that goes, I mean, uh, I think in a lot of different scenarios. And also there's a, a right to be forgotten. Basically, mm -hmm. the person has your, you have the personal information of a user and user has to have a easy way to ask you to, you know, delete everything that's related to that user. Um, there's also, I mean, that's the GDPR basics. I mean, um, gotcha. CPA, which is you know the California Protection Act, is it's kind of similar, but it's also different. I don't recall all the you know intricacies, but uh, yeah, you can you can obviously go. You, you always have to think about compliance. Of course, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, in the I also uh, in in, uh, in GDPR you have to also encrypt the data um, in at rest, and I believe also in transit. Uh, yeah, I, I think that that sounds right. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. No problem. So I have another question from the audience. Um, so we're if we're talking about the GDPR and the the private privacy stuff, so if um, there is any way how we could bypass the data privacy and avoid invading people's identities and connect the regulatory limitations of the data usage. I would definitely not call it by passing. Uh, I would just, you know, say how can we comply to that? And because that's basically how it's done. You um, uh, you have legislation, you have to, you know, comply to that legislation. Uh, so as I said, I, I've seen people, uh, you know, um, selling all kinds of information that, uh, um, for example, in healthcare, um, after just, you know, anonymizing the data, the data is still valuable. It's just, um, Typically, you don't. Well, first of all, you don't really need you know the personally identifiable identifiable data in the first place. I mean, if most of the time, I guess if you're if you're, if you're doing some kind of medical research, I'm, I'm not a healthcare professional, but I assume you don't really need a phone number of a person or their social security number or I don't know patient IDs or anything like that. You don't really need, or name of surname, right? That does not really share any meaningful information to their medical history. So uh, you should just anonymize that, you know, uh, uh, remove those fields and so and that's what a lot of companies are actually doing and um, the, the data still will be valuable, you know, but you also have to be very careful. I, I'm just thinking about the um, the scenario where um, if you have a disease where 
only like I know five people in the world are um, ha have that disease, then I mean theoretically, even if you don't provide their names or you know email addresses or that stuff, you potentially still could identify those people in that data by you know it, since they have a very specific, very um, unique disease and you know a combination of other factors may actually identify those people. But I'm I'm really talking about a very very specific edge case um, that shouldn't really be the case. I mean, if you just remove all of the you know emails, uh, um, phone numbers, I think uh, names, surnames, addresses. I think that that should really be enough. Okay, so an amazing sounds like an answer to the question. Thank you. If uh, there is any other who would like to join the conversation, or ask any question, just feel free. We still have a few minutes more. And, yeah, and if uh, not, so, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. If if you if you come up with a question uh, that you know after the presentation, once again, feel free to drop me a message in LinkedIn or my you know, work email, or um, if you find me on other social media. Um, um, I'm all for it. I, I love to talk about, you know, data monetization and, and data in general. So I'll be happy to help to try to help you. Yeah, you spoke about the anonymizing the data. So and that case, like in, in case of some rare disease, yeah, if you, you can basically detect the person just considering that it's one of them or some like something like that. Um, could we conclude that model weights that were trained like um, using some personal data are also a part of the uh, personally identifiable information and thus are also under the private data regulations uh, models you mean like machine learning models something like that yes yeah the trained machine learning models on the okay. data okay um I've I've read something about it about people you know discussing whether um, uh, we can actually uh, sh should machine learning models you know uh, be also compliant to that and but uh, I'm not really a person to to answer that question I think that should that question should be answered in in court basically it's just um, I mean, I, I do understand the problem. Obviously, you know, you train the model. Uh, it, it does not contain any of the raw data, obviously. But if you can, I mean, my personal, my personal um, um, view of this is that if you can use that the model in any way to to identify or to share some of the you know sensitive information, for example, I don't know, um, uh, you can. <laughs> It's it's kind of hard for me to to come up with a scenario, but I mean, if if you can use a, a machine learning model to identify a person in any way, then maybe yeah, that that should fall under you know under all of those legislations. But otherwise, once again, it's not really for me to answer this question. It's it's it should be um, I think a uh, thing that I, you know just uh, all people uh, I mean countries agree upon. And uh, that should be a part of the legislation. I mean, we have an interesting, um, basically, uh, we have an interesting uh, legislation legislation coming up in EU. Um, uh, that's about you know all kinds of simplifying the sharing of the data. Um, uh, that's a, uh, I think the, um, yeah, I think it should uh, be put into force into near, in nearest couple of months or something. But yeah, we should expect big changes in EU. I mean, a European Union, that's it. So yeah, I, I'm really happy to see that, you know, there are some changes in this field. Hopefully the machine learning models will not be, you know, uh, should not really comply to GDPR and people will be, you know, uh, allowed to train their models on whatever data you, they, they prefer. I, I'm, I'm really all for it. I hope for the same actually, so. Yeah. Okay, I think that for now, that's all also very short in time. So it's been, Great hosting you, Eugene. Thank you. Thank, Thank you a lot for your presentation. So we will share the video after the conference in a few days. We will share the presentation context. So everyone who would have any other questions who even didn't attend but have seen the video will be able to ask Eugene, James or Alex about their questions. So feel free to email them or contact them on LinkedIn. Thank you a lot, Eugene. Take care.